Hi, uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, feel kind of honored to be here uh, to get asked to do something. Um, so, um, who am I? I uh, have a master's degree in education, instructional design and technology. So I, my background is in education, educational psychology. I'm not a coder, but I work professionally as a game designer. Um, I work at the K-20 Center, which is a uh, educational research facility at the University of Oklahoma. And my department uh, designs and produces educational games for high school and college classes, um, as, long as, some, as well as some other games for other different uh, grants and contracts and things that we've done. Um, I've personally designed 15 games that have been published so far. Um, the longest of our games is about a 10 hour experience and it was over um, financial literacy, so teaching kids to budget and manage money. And our shortest game is probably about 45 minutes and we've got a couple of those that are about um, uh, statistics and uh, one about uh, growth mindset. And we've also worked on games that for calculus, business ethics, um, one that's teaching uh, intelligence analysts to avoid cognitive bias and decision-making errors, which is a cool game to work on, and several other subjects like that. So that's the kind of stuff that I do. Um, also, I've got a side business that I'm working on to try to start up board game and card game design. Um, that's just entertainment stuff, so I can actually get away a little bit away from education and just do some stuff for fun. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about educational games and how that's different and how it has different challenges from uh, games for entertainment. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of the theories of education and motivation in particular um, apply to all games. And they might be able to help you by looking at things from sort of this other perspective that you might not have, might help you with the design of your own games and just to think about them in a different way. So games have been used to teach since the beginning of time. I mean, since ancient times, people have used games as a way to teach kids and teach adults new skills and to heighten their skills and to improve at everything they do. And there's a lot of reasons why games are good at this. Um, first of all, they're fun. And we know from research that anytime somebody's actually into something and having fun, they pay more attention and then they learn more. Um, if you're not truly interested, if you're not truly enjoying what you're, you're learning, some of it's just going to pass right over you. Um, games are interactive, so they let you actually do the thing that you're learning, so you're not just sitting there passively listening to someone speak like you are right now. And um, you're actually getting to interact and do something, which is also helps you to learn better. Um, games let us change the instruction, so you're not just listening to one set static lesson. But the way you play the game can change the kind of instruction you get based on your own personal skills and abilities. Um, games can give you feedback. So rather than turning in an assignment and getting feedback weeks later, you get it immediately when you make a decision in the game. When you do something right or wrong, we can immediately tell you, hey, that's right, hey, that's wrong. Here's how you can do better and improve. And they encourage people to take risks. So in a classroom, you might be afraid to just try something new because you're afraid of getting a bad grade. Or, you know, in the real world, you might be afraid to try something different because there's real, like, hard consequences for what you're doing. But in a game, you can just try anything and learn from that. So um, education breaks things down into three basic theories of learning. Um, and these are behaviorism, which is sort of your classic kind of B.F. Skinner, Pavlov, like uh, reward and punishment type system. People will do things that you positively reward them for, and they'll avoid things that you punish them for. So there's a lot of games that use behaviorism, um, even just in the entertainment section. So any kind of game that's just a sort of click and reward type game. Um, and I put up Candy Crush and Diablo up there as sort of that. And all games have, like, use all of these. So I don't think I'm talking bad about Diablo because I'm throwing it in that. But any kind of game that's a point and click game that, that you're just excited about getting those rewards and those loots, that's tapping into behaviorism. It's tapping into that type of learning and triggering those same parts in your brain. And behaviorism can be good for a lot of things. It's not used in a lot of deeper education, but it's great for if you want to teach somebody how to do a repetitive task or teach somebody how to react to an emergency situation. There's lots of reasons to use it, but it's also considered sort of the, the the easier, sort of lighter version of it. Most education, most of the classes you've probably taken and most of the teachers you've, 
you, you've had, have probably used something closer to cognitivism, which is this idea that um, we build up mental models in our brain. So it's, it's schema theory, which is probably really similar to what you've learned in like a CS class, if, you, if you've had that kind of thing. It's just the idea that we organize information in certain ways, and then tapping into that organization and helping people build that organization helps them with that. And so any game where you're having to memorize a map, learn which strategies counter other strategies, and build up an overall idea through reputa repetition and trial and error and working on things to, to build up those mental models, that's using cognitivism. Uh, constructivism is the, the third type, and this is the type that as educational researchers we, we want to get more and more teachers to go to, and this is what games are really, really super good at. So Bethesda does this great, um, because they throw you into an open world, they don't really tell you what to do, they let you find it, and they give you just the minimum amount of help that you need to not just completely get bored and lose track and wander off on your own. So these games that are sort of open world like that, or Minecraft where it's just completely open and lets you do whatever you want and experiment and learn and play and just have fun that way, um, that falls more into that third type of theory. So um, anything that somebody's teaching probably falls into one or a combination of these theories. Games are able to hit all of them all at once and give you this more rounded experience that touches on a lot of different ways of learning that help a lot of people and can teach a lot of things. Um, so if you think about educational games, a lot of you probably will think of stuff like this, like Oregon Trail and Math Blasters and um, Sim Earth, which nobody played. Um, but those are the old school. That's what most people think of when they hear educational games. Like uh, Oregon Trail is the first thing that com comes to mind. But these days, people are doing all kinds of stuff. They've got games to teach um, the military, medical professionals, games that are teaching high-end like calculus, um, games that uh, are teaching you know, science, games that are looking for, at social change, um, to teaching people about you know, social ideas and making people think about things in new ways. People are using um, card games and board games and role playing games in uh, therapy and helping students through, um, through mental illness and stress and, and stuff like that through therapy. Uh, there's like a huge broad range of ways that games are being used for education now um, and they incorporate lots of different aspects and lots of different educational theories in ways that those old games weren't. So um, there's lots of different things that make a game good. Um, and there's lots of reasons that some of those old games like, like Math Flashers and Oregon Trail don't really fit into that. But um, one of the main things that I kind of think about that makes a game good is when the narrative, like the story of the game and the mechanics mesh up really well. So if you've got a game that connects uh, the story and the mechanics and they support each other really well, that's really fun. That's really en engaging for people. It really brings people in. And so some of examples of games that don't do that um, are things like uh, Exploding Kittens, which maybe I shouldn't make fun of because they did make a couple million dollars on Kickstarter. Um, and it's actually a pretty fun game. And it's got great art from the oatmeal and this great flavor text, but the art <coughs> and the, the, the little flavor text that goes on the cards has nothing to do with the mechanics of the game. The game is a sort of casual, sort of Russian roulette, uh, cutthroat, kind of backstabby kind of game. And the art is fun, but the two don't really go together. And as a casual player, you might not notice that, or you might not think about it, but it still kind of makes, makes it a little bit uh, different for you to learn the game and get into it because they don't quite mesh. So another good example is this guy. Um, most of us have probably played a game where the first time you fall in the water and you immediately drown and you're like, well, I'm this, this guy who can do all these things. Maybe I'm an assassin who can jump from buildings and, you know, fight all these guys or I'm this whatever character, but the game designer has used water as an artificial barrier, like a wall to keep the player in a certain area, which is a game mechanic. And that's fine because you need to keep your players on more or less on the track you want them to go on, but it's jarring to people because it's an example of narrative and mechanics not aligning. And now most of us as gamers, we get used to it because it happens in so many games that we just sort of take it for granted as part of like the language of games and how games work that we don't think about it anymore. But anybody that's new at this, it's a little weird, you know? And that's just a small example of mechanics and narrative not aligning. So um, what makes educational games different from that is the fact that not just do we have to align narrative and mechanics, we also have to align learning objectives. So learning objectives are the things that you're trying to teach in a game. 
And by the way, if anybody has questions, feel free to like just chime in and ask me what I'm talking about because I might just get rambly or I might be talking about something that has nothing to do with what anybody in this audience is interested in, but I'm going to keep going. Um, so learning objectives, uh, you know, put simply, are just the things you're trying to teach in the game. So you got something like Math Blasters, you know, the learning objectives, it might teach you because you're doing math and the mechanics support that, but the story has nothing to do with that. Why am I using numbers to shoot numbers? That doesn't make any sense. So it doesn't really quite align up. Or you look at something like Oregon Trail, where it's a really, actually kind of a fun game. Like, I actually like playing Oregon Trail. I like the hunting. I like trying to get across the river. Somebody always dies of dysentery. But you're never really quite clear what you're trying to learn in that. You know, and I'm not sure if anybody really ever learned anything from it, other than maybe it's really hard to get to Oregon. Um, so that's an example of, you know, the learning objectives not matching up with the other two. And then you've got something like Sim Earth, where you get what they're trying to go for, the, the, the idea of the game matches, but the mechanics just aren't really fun and don't really match up with the rest of the game. It's just sort of a slow plotting game where you're not really sure what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna get a little bit more into like how some of this might be kind of relevant to you. So a learning objective, when we write it, we write it in this particular way. So an example like that. So the first section is, you know, what resources is the student given? And then what do you want them to do? So in this case, they're given a map of the US. We want them to identify something. We want to identify state capitals. And then how well we want them to do it. So in a game, it might look something like this. Given the hook shot, the player can complete the swamp dungeon in 30 minutes. So I think a lot of game designers, when they're looking at mechanics and levels in games, they don't stop and break down exactly what they want the player to do and what the player's learning. Because when you get the, these new weapons in, in uh, the Zelda games, and they're a really good example of this because you get so many new weapons, and you start off with nothing, you know, and then you get a sword, and then maybe you get the bombs and the arrows and the, the master sword, and you get all these different things. If you gave all that to the player at the very beginning of your game, they would be overwhelmed. That would just be a whole lot of stuff to learn. The player would be overwhelmed and they'd get frustrated. But if you start with these little things one by one, you get the new weapon, it helps you get through the next dungeon. And now you know that. And then you get the next item, and it helps you get through the next dungeon. Maybe you have to combine the two in some new way. Um, so you build it up. So if you look at your levels and you look at the things that the student, or that the, the player, <laughs> switching back and forth between student and player, uh, the player's getting in the game, think about how long you want them to spend on that, how hard it's going to be for them and what they've got to work with and sort of break down what you want them to get through it like that. And I know that sounds like a really simple kind of basic point, but I've talked to a lot of people and I find a lot of people don't stop and break down their designs in that way and it can actually really help you look at that. So uh, one note on this is when we use those verbs, I, we try to pick out words that, uh, verbs that uh, identify a behavior. So like something you can actually see the person do. So words like understand and know don't really work because you can't know what your players are knowing. You don't know what they know. You don't know what they understand, but you know what they do in the game. You can see what they do. And so you can see that they're actually accomplishing what you expect them to accomplish, that they've actually gone through your tutorials or gone through your levels and they're, they're doing what you expect them to do to, to keep going through the game and get to that next level and keep moving along. Um, so. That's the first section. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments on that part? Right. That's a good point, and that gets me right into the next thing I'm talking about. Um, so the next thing I was going to talk about is, is this thing called flow theory. So this guy, he's got a crazy name. I think it's pronounced, I might get this wrong, but I think it's pronounced Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Congratulations, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is how you know. It's trying to keep them in that little middle channel there. So everything you add increases the difficulty, increases the challenge. And you've got to make sure that their skill is up to the point where they can incorporate that new, that new challenge, that new knowledge. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, and I think this has been used a lot in game design, so some of you might have seen it before, the higher, if, if your challenge um, is too high compared to your skill, you get anxious, you get frustrated, and you want to quit. 
if you're if the challenge of the game, the difficulty is too low compared to your skill, you get bored. And then you also want to quit because it's just not, it's not challenging you. So the trick is to keep them in that middle level. Yeah, kind of. No, you go ahead and ask you. Go ahead. Yes. So yeah, the idea being that you increase the difficulty and hopefully keep them right under that level of anxiety where they don't want to quit. And then let it drop off a little bit and ease up on them. And then you bring it back up. And kind of doing that, you can extend your gameplay for the amount of you know, difficulty challenge you've got in your game. And also keep them in that sort of band where you're controlling, you know, that they're not getting bored and they're not getting anxious. And now how do you do that in practice? Play testing. Play testing, play testing, play testing, play testing. You know, and you can um, do a little bit of what we do, which is collect... If, if you're able to in your play tests or, or however you're publishing your games, collect a little bit of player data and see what people are doing. They are. That is true. That, that's true. And so now the optimal game, like the perfect game, would adapt. The perfect game would notice, you know, through whatever mechanic that it's getting too challenging for people, and it'd lower the difficulty. Or it noticed that you're getting bored and would raise the difficulty. Like how you do that in practice is, is a design decision and, and is something that's really complicated and a lot of people work really hard on doing that. Yeah, like think of, think of, the, uh, think of the matching um, algorithms that they use in things like Call of Duty and Overwatch. You know, they try to match you with a group of players that fits you. So they want to keep you in, they want to keep you in this flow state. If they put you in with a group of players that's way better than you, you're going to get mad because you're never winning anything and you're going to quit. If you put you in with players that are way too easy, then eventually you'll just get bored and quit. So they, they, they write those algorithms and they do that matching as best they can to try to get you in there. And we all know that even though you know, these are big AAA companies and even they have trouble matching people sometimes in that, in that perfect zone. Um, That's true, yeah. Um, Left 4 Dead actually does a pretty good job of that because they'll control, yeah, they'll control how many zombies are coming out and like when those waves come based on how, how well you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. We did a little bit of biometric stuff um, a few years ago. We did some eye tracking, and it's really hard to gauge. And it's really hard to do. It's really hard to use that biometric data to gauge difficulty and, and engage engagement. Yeah, access to that whole technology that seems to be trying to incorporate into VR to track eyes. Right. In see, that's the thing. Is like, in, in the lab, people are always going to be different than they are in their, in their home or wherever they're playing the game, you know, out in the wild. You know, so even if you're tracking heart rate and, and eye movement in the lab, that doesn't always correspond to what they're going to do out in the wild. Um, but anyway, one of the, I found this graph um, while I was looking through this stuff, and I really love this idea that you're, within each level, you're varying the difficulty and increasing it, and then you're just kind of tapering it off, just dipping it down. So once they get that to the end of a world, you know, then you give them that save point, you give them a little bit of reprieve and then build them back up again. Um, just keeping it, you know, keeping it building and keeping it, you know, release the tension and let it build back up again. Release it. Yeah, it's good, it's good storytelling and it also keeps people in that, in that, um, that flow, you know, channel. So, um, Another theory that applies really well to um, games is um, self-determination theory of motivation. So this theory basically sh sees motivation as sort of a spectrum. So over here on um, your left is amotivated. So somebody that just doesn't care, they don't want to do it, they're not interested. Um, and then all the way on the right, you've got intrinsic motivation, which basically means that you're just really into it for the sake of doing it. You like it just because you like it and because you want to do it because it's fun, you're into it. Um, the interesting part comes in the middle. So extrinsic motivation is anything outside of yourself that is pushing you to be motivated to do something. 
So in education, we talk about this for um, ways to get, you know, ways to get students to, to learn and, 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 and things like that. And the idea is that the more you can push them to the right of that graph, more toward intrinsic motivation, the better. So these first couple of uh, uh, categories here, um, external regulation is basically pushing somebody, it's basically, you know, motivation through punishment. You know, saying that if you don't do this, um, you know, you'll get punished, you'll get something taken away from you. We pretty much don't want to do that in games. We pretty much don't want to do that in education or in life. That's really kind of like a bad way of doing things. And you really only do that in the worst cases. I mean, this is the sort of like, you know, don't steal stuff or we'll throw you in jail kind of motivation. You know, only, only when nothing else fails. And then you move up the, the next level is um, interjected regulation, which is, it says somewhat external. This is um, more of the rewards and punishment. This is more of, it, it can be, you know, positive as in like, you know, I give you something, you know, that you like, you know, I'll pay you to do this. Maybe, you know, I'll pay you to go to work, you know, or um, I'll guilt trip you if you don't take out the trash. It could be anything within that range. This works a little bit better than just, you know, the straight up forced external type, but it's still a little iffy. And one of the weird things about this is that, and any of these, is that if somebody is higher up that scale and you try to use a lower version on them, it just makes them mad. And it just makes them not want to be motivated and want to quit. So you want to move it up there. So identified regulation is personal importance. importance. Um, this is where you're starting to like realize that it's good for you, that it helps you in some way, that, that um, this is something you want to do for your own good. Um, and then integrated regulation is, this is who I am. This is part of me. This is, this is, this is how I identify as myself, and I'm going to do this thing because it's who I am. So how does this apply to game design? Well, like I said, you kind of don't want to do the external regulation. That's just bad. Um, the interjected regulation, a lot of games, and especially the ones that in incorporate those behavior elements, do this. But those are sort of a shallow version of motivation. People are going to like lose interest in those pretty quick if you don't have something deeper for them to get motivated in, something deeper to hook them in the game to make them want to play it more. And that's where you get things like um, the identified and integrated. So stuff like creating your own avatar, uh, joining up with a guild, um, you know, joining joining uh, you know a team on on you know your your first person shooter game or whatever. Um, having a story that you can get involved in and something that you can affect, all of that moves people closer toward that identified and integrated. You know, make it something they can identify with. Make it something they can get into. Something that they, you know, feel a, a personal connection to. Because the more you feel like a personal connection to, you more you get it toward intrinsic motivation. And like I said, if you've got a really good game, it's probably going to hit intrinsic motivation like right off because games are fun. We want to play them, you know, and these other things are only sort of necessary if you're trying to get somebody into something that they might otherwise not be. Just the main takeaway here is note that if you try to use something that's farther down the list, it's got a good chance of actually demotivating your players rather than motivating them. So... Um, Moving on to another theory, and I realize I'm kind of taking up a lot more time than I thought I was. Uh, basic needs theory of uh, self-determination theory. So this is a sub-theory of this previous one. So the idea here is what makes something intrinsic motivation? So we said that's, you know, it's, it's personal enjoyment. It's just really getting into something because it's fun. Well, that's pretty vague. So what makes it fun? What makes it, you know, what m makes it intrinsic? And this theory basically says that there's three different things that do that. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So autonomy is basically having control over stuff. Um, it's basically, you know, being able to have control over your life, over what you're doing, and not being railroaded, not being forced into things. So uh, in some experiments, this, these researchers found that people who were um, given extrinsic rewards for behavior it actually lowered their motivation 
what, for it was something that they actually found fun. So if you're doing something that's fun and you try to give, try to you know, pay money, somebody money for them or give them some outside reward or something, it actually demotivates them because it makes them, it devalues that and kind of pulls them away from that intrinsic motivation down to the, those lower levels. Um, so to apply this to games, players want to have an effect on the world. They don't want to be railroaded. They don't want it to be pushed through the story that you've written for them. They want to be able to craft the story themselves. They want to know that the things they do in the game affect the outcome. Because if their character wasn't ever there in that story, then it doesn't matter. You know, or if it's a completely sandboxy game, they want to be able to craft a story out of it. You know, they want to be able to play Civ or Minecraft or whatever and later go and say, oh, this is what happened you know, in my game. I was doing great, building everything up, and then the Aztecs attacked me out of nowhere. And then you, you can build this whole story of it because you have control over it, and you know that the things you do affect things. So the second thing is competence. This is um, feeling like you're good at something. And this um, actually, uh, again, games do a really good job of giving you feedback and giving you rewards. So if you do something good in the game, if you're good at it, if you succeed, and you give the player some reward, you give them you know, experience points or loot or whatever it happens to be, you know, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they've accomplished something. If they don't get that win, then eventually they will get frustrated and they will become demotivated. And this fits right back in with um, the flow theory. So players want to feel like they're progressing and getting better. If they're not getting better at the game, if they don't feel like the choices that they make and the things they do are helping them to succeed and get better, then they will become demotivated. And if this is a skill-based game, like a shooter or something, you know, they want to make sure that they're on a level where that, that matching comes into play, where they can practice their skills at a level they feel comfortable at so that they can get better and win sometimes. They don't have to win all the time, but win sometimes. Um, because not feeling good at something does not make you want to do that thing. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of lowering the difficulty and letting them have that win so they can build back up to it. So the third thing is relatedness, and this one's a little different. This is being connected to people. Um, and there's two different ways that you can do this. So it doesn't have to be a multiplayer game to have relatedness. <clears throat> it can, and if it's a multiplayer game, you basically want to make sure that your player has, um, has a role. You know, that if it's a 40-man raid, that they have a role that they're actually contributing to that raid, and they're not just standing around waiting for loot to drop. Um, because then they don't have that. They don't feel like they're part of something. You know, if you're on a if you're on a five man team in Overwatch, you want to make sure that what you're doing actually your role matters. You know, it matters that you have a healer there. If you don't have a healer there, it's bad. You know, or it matters that you have that DPS guy. Every every position and every class you play in that game, whatever you're doing, needs to have a a purpose for that player to be there, so that they feel like they're they're contributing and and included. If it's a single player game, it's a little bit different. Uh, for single player experience, there's still a story you tell and you still want to feel like you're part of that story. And so in a narrative, you can feel relatedness by feeling connected to the characters in the story. If your player isn't related, it isn't like connecting to your NBCs or isn't connecting to the, the PC, then they might not feel this relatedness component and that is also demotivating. Um, and if it's an open world game, it's a sandbox game, then maybe they just want a story they can tell their friends. They want to be able to like build up that story of what happens and then go, you know, tell somebody about that later. Um, so uh, the last one that I'm going to go over is achievement goal theory. And this has a little bit to do with how people perceive um, different types of goals and uh, particularly goals that have a, a challenge that you can succeed or fail at. So you can be just straight up amotivated. There's always the, the, the option that somebody just isn't interested and they don't care. But then you have performance and mastery. So mastery want to get better. Like these are people that are focused on getting better at something and performance people are just focused on what they look like. So it comes in two flavors. You can be either avoidance, which basically just means you don't want to look bad. You know, this is the, you know, if it's a student, it's the student who doesn't want to turn in their homework because they don't want to like look like they got the wrong answers. So they just want, would rather look like they're lazy. If it's performance, this is the person who Maybe they're the showboat on the basketball team, and they're not actually looking to win. They're just looking to make sure that they look like the MVP player. Um, and you get people like this in gaming all the time. If you've ever played in a, in, a, in a competitive game that has open chat networks, you'll see these people. You'll see these people that would rather spend time you know, complaining about why the team can't win 
or why they're so awesome and why it's your fault they can't win, rather than actually doing anything to contribute to, to, to the group succeeding. Um, so in a competitive game, um, people that are avoidance-oriented, uh, they don't want to do it. People that are approach-oriented really want competitive games. They really love that because they want to look good, as long as they're good at it. If they're bad at it, they might move into avoidance and just not want to do it. Um, the mastery-oriented people, the people that want to play just for the fun of it or just to get better at it, to learn, they don't really care about competition one way or the other, but they don't avoid it. And I bring this up because, in particular, the educational games that we produce, we avoid competition in a lot of cases. It's not always bad because it can sometimes take people who are amotivated and make them motivated because they're interested in competition. They want, they want a challenge like that, and it gives them a reason to do an activity or learn something. But it also has the opportunity to demotivate some people that might otherwise be interested in it. In contrast, you have uh, cooperation. This actually incorporates more people. So there might be some of those people that are, that are really competitive that aren't into cooperative games, or they just want to look like, still look like they're the best. But for the most part, it includes more people. And this isn't to say that comp competitive games are bad. I love competitive games. But just know that there's certain ways that people think about competition and cooperation and ways that people think about games and uh, activities that they're good at or bad at that affect that. And this kind of explains a little bit of why somebody might take a certain attitude in a, in a, you know, in a team chat channel or something uh, based on their outlook, their outlook on, on their goals and on, on winning the game. So um, I hope that wasn't too rambly because I just threw out a whole bunch of different theories and a, a bunch of random stuff that I think can apply to, uh, to you guys when you're thinking about game design. So if anybody has any questions um, or anything else you want to talk about um, that's within the realms of you know, psychology or, or games or anything, um, feel free. What advice would I give somebody who wants to make educational games? Um, <laughs> it's difficult. There's not a whole lot around here, to tell you the truth, in the Oklahoma area um, that's producing that. Um, and there's not a whole lot of ways to get funding for it, and there's not a whole lot of people selling. So that's the bad news. The good news is that it's becoming more well accepted nationally. People are um, accepting games as, as, as a legitimate way of teaching and, and you know, something that's okay to put in the classrooms at a, at a bigger and bigger scale all the time. So what I did was I got into um, instructional design, and I started looking at that side of it and um, learning about education, because I came from a, a media production and game design background a little bit, like, like analog games, um, and came into this. And so instructional design is the field of um, developing and designing instructional content for any kind of training or anything. And that's what I got into and how I got into it. Um, I would say look into and read about instructional design a little bit. Look into some of the companies that are out there doing this. Um, a lot of them are in, uh, there's, there's places, a lot of places around DC that do contracting with the, with the government and the military that do instructional design. There's a lot of places around the Great Lakes area in uh, Madison and uh, Lansing that have companies that produce educational games. There's some in California, there's a few in Texas, in Dallas and Austin, and there's some in Vermont. There's places all over, so I would just start looking around at um, some of the companies that do these things and seeing what else is out there. There's a lot of things out there. Start reading about instructional design and learning um, how it can apply to games. And I can give you some, uh, some references. I don't have them off hand, but some references to some books and things that might be helpful. Sure. Right, so the question is, is it harder to achieve flow in a single player game as opposed to a multiplayer game because you lack community, so it'd be harder to get that, that relatedness aspect? Um, potentially, yes. 
Um, but not necessarily, because relatedness, as I understand it anyway, can be achieved to some degree through narrative. Because we, we, um, when we're telling stories, we reflect on the characters on the stories and we feel like we're part of that story. So if you've got a really well-written narrative, that can help people feel related and connected to those characters in a way that um, sometimes they don't to other people. Um, so that can do that. Um, but even so, for a lot of single player games, people still form communities around these games and they talk about them and they do a lot of things outside of games that foster that, that relatedness aspect. And you see that all the time and that's one of the reasons that we like things like Twitch because we like watching other people play these games and feeling connected with them um, in that way as they move through these stories. So um, I don't know if that answers your question because yeah, there are some challenges with it that you lose when you don't have multiplayer, but there are other, other tools, especially through narrative that you can latch onto and things outside of the game. Yeah. What about, what about endless games where the game only actually ends when you lose or something like, you know, Hulkamania, Tetris, or Dark Mario? So, um, even on those games, you're getting those rewards because you beat a level, right? Every time you beat a level in Tetris or Dr. Mario or, or whatever, you feel that reward because you're like, oh, I just got a little bit farther. Um, and that's kind of hooking into, it's, it's hooking into this part of our psychology that makes us just want to keep pushing just a little bit more and just get that next thing and get that next loot. And there's a lot of people who are really driven by that. Um, and I think that fits into some other different, some other different psychological theories. Uh, besides kind of what I've talked about here, but I don't think that having an endless game doesn't undermine that. You know, there's, there's certain people that want to finish a game and see the end of that story and the end of that arc, but there's other people who just want to keep improving and pushing forward and maybe hit that next goal, you know, get that next level, get that next, you know, magical item or whatever they're looking for. Um, and that can be really motivating, you know, just to push people to just get that little bit further. When it would be demotivating is if you spread those levels out too much. So maybe I, I beat the first three levels and then level four, the difficulty just shoots through the roof and all of a sudden I can't get anywhere and I just feel like I'm completely stuck, you know? But as long as you break those down into small enough chunks that people feel like they can get through each little bit and get that reward at the end of each little bit, um, you can keep them going for up until they just can't beat it anymore. Sure. About uh, your workflow, like how, how your team works together, like how many people are working, like collaborating on stuff, and then um, sort of as you talk about um, finding that combination between education, team, and mechanics, are you typically, I, I assume that you're starting with an educational uh, something you know, every time, but do you sort of craft the mechanics and how, how do you like strike that balance? Sure. Um, so the question is, how, do, how does our workflow work and how do we strike the balance between learning objectives and game mechanics? So basically what we do is someone comes to us with a course or a particular topic um, and we're, we work with a subject matter expert. And so these are people who are either an expert in their field or they are a professor of a particular topic or a teacher or, or whatever. And we talk to them about what their, um, what their needs are. You know, what are students having trouble with? Um, what is really hard for students to learn in that class? And sometimes we do this through reviewing the literature and sometimes we get it directly just from the subject matter expert themselves. So once we've established that, once we know what we're trying to teach, then we write the learning objectives like I showed um, the ones earlier. Um, and I'm usually the one that writes those. So I take them and I, I write them out, get those confirmed to make sure that that is specifically what we want to teach. And we know a little bit how, about how we want to assess it. We, want to, we know how we want to prove that the student has learned it. So I start with those and those are the basis. Those are the, 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 the first building block that I use on an educational game is having solid written out learning objectives. Um, and then I go in and I try to design a game. So I just sit down and I write up a pitch that says, okay, Here's the story, um, here's the game mechanics involved, 
when the player's doing this, they're learning objective number one. When they're doing this, they're learning objective number two. When they're doing this, they're learning objective number three. And then we'll give them feedback if they don't do well on this. And we'll have them go back and do this other thing so that then we can show that they learned it and then they move on to the next one. So the first component, learning objectives, and then I connect mechanics with those. Then it's always a matter of revising and going back to that subject matter expert and going back to the team and making sure that those line up. So once we have that, then I write out the full game design and I turn that over to uh, the developers and the artists and they start building that out. Um, once we've got the game built and there's usually some iterations and some vetting in the middle of the process, then we take it back to the subject matter expert, make sure that everything teaches the way they expect, and then we put it in front of students, and we have students play it. And we do play tests, and we'll uh, make sure that everybody can play it, and that they feel like they're learning, and that they, they enjoy the game, and it's going well. And then we do more formal play tests, where we have them uh, usually take a pretest and then play the game, and then take a post-test, and we usually also have a control group that is either they play a different unrelated game, or they listen to a lecture, or watch a video, or do something that's not that's a control that's not our game. And we compare those two groups and see if one group learns more than the other. And we can even go into the behavioral data and see what decisions players have made in the game and try to break that down and compare it with how they've done on the pre and post test to kind of tease out what's working and what's not. And sometimes we get a lot of good information out of that and sometimes we don't. You don't really ever know until you sit down and look at it. But based on that information, we can then go back and revise the game and improve it and try to get it even tighter to where it's uh, really strong, more strongly teaching those learning, uh, learning objectives and hopefully improve the mechanics and stuff from there. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, anybody else? Oh, go ahead. Uh, she has a question too, so. So, um, so I will say, like, nationwide, our financing for educational research is not that strong at the moment um, due to various political things that are happening in the country. Um, I, you know, not to go in too far into that, but um, there are um, still a lot of grants out there that are doing it. Uh, the grant that I'm currently working on is going to end um, next summer, um, and we're pursuing other grant opportunities. Um, a lot of our funding comes from the Department of Education. Um, we've gotten some funding from the uh, University of Oklahoma and some from the National Science Foundation and some from IARPA, which is the Pentagon's um, Intelligence Research Division. That was a fun project to work on. Um, but overall, um, Games, uh, game research and education, a lot of it comes from these big national agencies like that to produce the games and to test the games and hopefully disseminate the games. But um, sadly, in a lot of cases, these games end up getting tested and then put in a Indiana Jones style warehouse somewhere. Yeah, and nobody ever sees them again. Um, we've managed to get our games out to several thousand students uh, through Oklahoma and we're working now on some programs to get them on uh, to get some other partners to host our games on their servers so that we offload the, the hosting costs and then even once our grant funding ends those games will still be available to students but that doesn't always happen and um, schools themselves have very limited budgets and so a lot of times if you're relying on direct sales to sell these games, it's really very difficult because um, for one, you have to get them to accept the idea that an educational game is a good idea. And that's happening more and more, but it's still a challenge in a lot of places. And then get them to spend the money on it, which they often don't have. We don't... There is a lot of value and there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential. Um, we don't have any other third party investors like that. We've worked on some, some finite contracts and these grants and that's about it. Uh, there are in other places, like I know of um, at least one company in Dallas that's got some private investing and they're doing some really cool stuff with some, uh, some calculus games. 
um, that looks it looks like um, I don't know like like Tomb Raider or something, and you're running around in this world with all these crazy puzzles. But to actually solve the puzzles, you need to use um, calculus and limits and things. Um, and it's really cool. And they've got a lot more money to work with on that project than we do. Um, and I hope they, you know, are able to uh, make it a financially value, uh, viable product. But a lot of times it's a struggle, you know, as it is with any game. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so um, the question is, if, if I understand what you're asking, that you want to know how, how age uh, relates to motivations and, and, and uh, the theories that I talked about and, and, and game mechanics. So mostly I've worked with um, junior high and up, junior high through college students. So I haven't worked with younger students a lot. So I'll, I'll try my best to answer this question, but I don't know if I'm, I'm fully um, qualified in that. So there are a lot of educational theories on um, developmental um, learning and how students learn. And one of the main researchers on that is Piaget. And he talks about different stages of learning and how, how we learn at different ages. Um, younger students are, of course, going to have you know, a shorter attention span. They're going to they're gonna need things with less reading. They're going to need things that um, maybe trigger those sort of behavioral aspects a little bit easier rather than the, the, the uh, sort of constructivist type things. Even though I've seen really young kids play Minecraft and love it, you know, and just do crazy things in that. Um, so I think there is some difference, and I don't want to speak too much about the specifics because that's not really, I'm not, I'm not too read up on that. But yeah, I would say that there, there are some, if you're working with particularly very young kids, there's some, probably some different um, constraints and things you'd want to you want to consider. Okay. Oh, oh, we got more. So I have to really pay attention to the educational games since I was a little kid myself, on the Forest Trail. Uh, what What are some examples of stuff they have these days? I mean, you mentioned there's a whole lot more. There, there are a whole lot, and. Um, you know, it's a little bit difficult to pick out actual ones that you might have heard of, but um, there's, uh, let me see, there's a company called Filament up in um, uh, Michigan. If you look at their website, they've got some really great games on there. Um, I can't remember the name of the guys down in Dallas, but I could, I, uh, I'll have to find their website and show you that. There's a company called Tilt Factor up in Virginia that does card games and things, and they've got some really cool games on the market. Um, uh, one called Awkward Moment, one called Buffalo, both that I love because they're just teaching through social interaction and getting kids to sort of think about social things in different ways. Um, there's uh, some games that kind of loosely fit into this, like Never Alone, which is the uh, Inuit game. It's a side scroller that helps sort of like, that's built into, um, I believe it's Inuit or, or a, 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 might be another tribe in Alaska, I don't want to misspeak, but um, shows their culture and sort of looking at gaming through, through their culture and has some, some um, elements of teaching sort of their, their myths and legends and, and their beliefs and, and history um, built into that game, and that's a fairly popular one. There's um, some things that you might not really think of games but kind of fit into sort of gamification, things like Duolingo, uh, Duolingo. Um, which is, yeah, which is a really good program for teaching um, foreign languages, and it is a gamification program. So there's things like that, um, lots of things that are incorporating um, game elements into non-games um, along those lines. Um, I mean, there's no, there's no Citizen Kane of like educational games out there, so there might not be anything that you that you know. Specifically, but people are doing new versions of uh, Oregon Trail and uh, lots of other things like that as well.
the game development community in, in Oklahoma City in general? Um, you, you might be able to answer that better than I can. I don't actually know. How, how big is the game development community in Oklahoma? It's like three or five million, something somewhere around those lines. And I think that, I mean, groups like this and meetings like this and talks like this are, are the start of that, right? So I, I'm new to this group. I've only been here a couple times now. Um, and I didn't know about it before that either. But now that I'm in, I'm, you know, I'm enjoying the community. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm honored that, you know, you guys let me speak and that you're interested in hearing what I've got to say. And I mean, I think that's great, you know. And I do know some people in the film community too, and they're, they're trying their best to get things together and get some, some stuff off the ground. And we have done some pretty cool stuff here. We've got a lot of uh, potential. We do have people. And I think as projects come along and they need, a, need to bring people on them, um, 
we've got the you know we've got talent here you know and uh, hopefully there are hopefully there are you know I'm sure everybody has business cards. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I want to keep talking about this, but, yeah, let's make sure nobody else has any other questions, and then we can wrap up, and then we can have a discussion. So does anybody else have any questions? All right. Oh, wait, we got one more. We got one more. Oh, awesome. He's got the bill of his game, if anybody wants to try it. All right, thank you guys. I really appreciate you having me out, and I hope this was uh, interesting and helpful for you guys. Thanks.